Thank you uh, all, and welcome to this noble event. Uh, Nobel. Uh, yes, Nobel. Uh, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> where did that come from? Uh, no, there's no bell. Ah, clever. I'm comedian Sammy Obeyed. And I am comedian Daya Lakshmi Narayanan. And we're here today because we were asked to do this event. Yes, our good friend Albert Menkfeld is responsible for what you're seeing tonight. Also because the first three economists that they asked said no. So let's begin by bringing up our moderator for the event and our dear friend, Mr. Albert Menkfeld. And to be clear, not a Nobel laureate. Please, round of applause. No, Nobel. Nobel at all. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. So now let's introduce the laureates, shall we? Yes, while Albert is taking his seat, we'll get to the uh, heart of the matter. Uh, Oliver Hart, our Nobel Prize winning uh, professor is here. He is famous for his work on contract theory. Please, Oliver, you can come to the stage. Yes. You're allowed to give him more applause than Albert, by the way. <laughs> We'd like you to applause until they sit down. That would be nice. <laughs> by the way, Albert is smiling, so he's enjoying this. And next, we'd like to welcome to the stage Professor Bengt Holmstrom. Yes. Known for his Nobel Prize winning work on the theory of incentives. You can keep applauding until he gets to the stage. He's a big deal. And also, uh, Nobel Prize winner Paul Milgram, um, he's famous for his work on auction theory. He's joining us from California because he's unable to be here in person. So today we'll just be giving a brief introduction to the event and then you'll be witnessing a fascinating panel discussion. And now that our Nobel Prize winners are joining us uh, in this room, the mean Nobel Prize per person is now 0 .005. Congratulations oh, to all nice. of you. That's a, that's a mean joke. <laughs> well, we're both on stage together, so we're co-medians. <laughs> oh, does that fall a normal distribution or does a Nobel curve? <laughs> wow, you're really in stand-up mode, Sammy. Very nice, very nice. Meanwhile, while you're enjoying this wonderful event with our esteemed colleagues here, Sammy and I are going to be backstage in a small room sweating while we try to come up with jokes based on what you're about to hear and see. Because we didn't prepare beforehand, basically. Um, all the jokes will be in good jest, of course. There's no competition here because comedian is the one industry that will never be nominated for a Nobel Prize. <laughs> And we have been asked and told not to roast the Nobel laureates, which we will definitely abide by, but we've also been told that Albert is fair game. So please, one more hand for our wonderful, brilliant Nobel laureates. <laughs> and also Albert, okay. <laughs> uh, well, let's talk a little bit about why these people are on stage tonight and what they've done to deserve the Nobel Prize. Um, Oliver Hart, are you familiar with contract theory? Uh, didn't read it, it wasn't in my contract. He is well known for uh, talking about the principal agent problem. Yeah, I don't have an agent, nor do I have principals. <laughs> Sammy, you should know all this, that all contracts are incomplete. Wait, all contracts are incomplete? Correct, that's right. Ah. Ding, ding, ding. There it is again. So how do you remedy that? Well, we never know what um, the future holds, what future scenarios are. So we have to anticipate the unanticipated. What, like time travel? Possibly. We also need to understand that optimal power distribution is important and we cannot give power to the wrong person. Next, uh, Professor Bengt Holmström, 
Uh, he's famous for payment based on performance, which is sometimes not optimal because effort is unobservable. And in some cases, you will need a flat fee. Flat feet? I have those. It's horrible. Good thing we are not being paid by performance, Sammy. But the point is we put in effort, huh? And then uh, we want to talk about Paul Milgram, correct? Yes. So Professor Paul Milgram, who won't be joining us in person today, is known for his groundbreaking work on auction theory. And that must be pretty hard, studying auctions, right? Especially with how fast auctioneers talk, right? 25,000, 50,000, 100,000, sold the Nobel Prize winner. No, Sammy, that is not what his research is about. I'm so sorry, Professor. Well, it seems as you have more information than I do. Uh, unfortunately, yes, that's called uh, information asymmetry. There you go again. Did you read any of these people's work before you came to the stage tonight? To be honest, I got 12 hours of sleep last night. Yeah, wow. because I started reading uh, Professor Menkfeld's work on non-standard errors. Well, with that said, let's hand it over to the real moderator of tonight, Professor Albert Menkfeld. Thank you so much, Albert, for having us. <laughs> we'll be back soon. Th thank you, uh, uh, Daya and, and Sammy, uh, for the introduction. Um, <coughs> and and uh, yeah, at this point, I, I want to express on behalf of all of us at the European Finance uh, Association, uh, including myself, of course, the gratitude to uh, the Nobel laureates for being here. Uh, we have 50 years of EFA uh, meetings. Uh, my first one was 25 years ago, actually, in Paris. And I've enjoyed each and every one of them. And if you have 50, then it's time to celebrate. And the idea was to have Nobel laureates. And, 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 and the dream came true. Um, what should we ask them? Um, and then I thought, I should not think of that. It's actually you should think of that. It should be the community. And you might remember that when you registered for this conference, one of the questions was, do you have a question that you'd like the, uh, to, to be asked to the Nobel laureates? And, and many of you answered. Uh, and, and I basically have uh, half a half dozen questions here that I think are, uh, are very uh, uh, nice for us to think about. Um, I mean, us, I mean, the Nobel laureates, and, and discuss with them. Uh, and so that's, that's, the, uh, th that's what we're going to do, to do the, the next hour. Uh, if, we're, if we're sort of close to the hour, you will have an opportunity uh, to ask yourself uh, any questions that uh, we have not touched upon. So with fur without further ado, um, the first question I'd like to uh, direct uh, to you, uh, Oliver. Um, uh, 50 years uh, of financial economics. Uh, what, what good has it done uh, to society? Uh, have our discoveries helped society? Uh, was it all good or, or, or were there ways in which we actually caused damage? Uh, in, a, in a time of Oppenheimer, we know that scientific discovery is not necessarily always good. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, thank you, Albert. Thanks for inviting me. And um, it's a little hard looking out of the, with the bright lights, I can't really see whether there's anybody out there, but I <laughs> guess there are. Um, <laughs> so one of the things, so I think I can go back before, you know, longer than 50 years, just look at the finance generally, the, um, what the profession has, has done for us. Um, I think on the positive side, um, I would pick out the fact that these days, um, if you think about how people invest their pensions um, or other things, but let's say particularly pension money, I mean, many people around the world, certainly in, in the United States, but I think also in Europe, um, put the, their savings in the stock market. Uh, they hold a diversified portfolio, and many of them would also choose an index fund. And I, if I think about those things, I think you know, the finance profession can take credit for a lot of that because, you know, once upon a time, uh, uh, it was thought that a trustee for somebody um, who was investing their money, you know, money on their behalf should choose very safe things like government bonds, this kind of thing. Um, and then over time, that's evolved. And now, you know, people said, wait a minute, what about the stock market? Isn't that better? And, you know, once upon a time, it would have been a breach of fiduciary duty of the trustee 
I think to put the money in the stock market, it would have been seen as too risky. But now it's seen as a breach of duty not to put it in the stock market. Um, so, you know, I, I think the work of Markowitz and Sharp and others certainly was um, very influential in that um, shift in view. And then also, if we take the efficient market hypothesis, that sort of told us, uh, even though we know it, it's not always true, but um, it's, it's, it has, you know, convinced people that uh, not many people can make money out of the stock market, can beat the stock market. So maybe the best thing to do is not to have your money actively managed in stocks, but rather to choose something like an index fund where it's passive. Um, and so, and I think not everybody does that, but a lot of people do that. So these are, I think, a very important and, and really quite enormous shifts that have taken place. Mm. Um, so that's, that's positive. Um, I think you also want me to talk about maybe some negatives. Um, I see a negative as uh, coming from the fact that the finance profession, if I think of corporate finance, over the last, last 50 years, the emphasis has been on agency problems between managers and shareholders. Um, they are, of course, important, but somehow the view has been shareholders all want to make as much money as possible. Um, they want... Um, share price value maximization, managers may have their own goals. So what do we do about that? We have to incentivize managers, put them on high-powered incentive schemes, give them shares, stock options as part of their compensation. And, you know, I, there's some, certainly some good sides to that, but there are also some negatives. And this actually relates very much the negative, some of the negatives to uh, Banks and Paul's work on multitasking. And we see what can happen if you have um, if, the, if the compensation is too high powered, we can get things like Enron, uh, we can get things like Boeing, where they, you know, cut costs and sacrifice safety, and we had two big crashes. Um, I think we also see uh, pollution, companies polluting, um, because they're only focused on the bottom line. And I think, uh, you know, another thing that we've got wrong is that um, shareholders don't always want to just make as much money as possible because, uh, you know, they're human beings and they care about um, whether they or their children or grandchildren live in a hotter world or whether maybe uh, people they're unrelated to live in a hotter world. So they might want a company they're invested in to reduce their carbon footprint, even if that hurts the bottom line. This is something I think that traditionally we have not taken seriously. I think we are taking it more seriously now, and I think I looked at the program at this conference, and there are papers on this, and I'm very happy to see them. Um, just to throw in one last thing, um, activist investors. Um, you know, I used to think that activist investors were great because they were aligning uh, preferences of um, managers, you know, who were doing their own thing with the preferences of shareholders, so, so this was all good. But I, know, I don't think of that. I don't think that way anymore because, I mean, what? let's take the case of a company that is uh, not polluting that much. You know, it has reduced its carbon footprint at the expense of profit. Some activists can come along and push it in the other direction. This may not actually be what the shareholders want at all. Maybe the managers do is currently doing exactly what the shareholders want and the, uh, and the activist investor is going to uh, disrupt that. So, you know, I think these are, these are important things that are now being considered, but, uh, you know, not, have not been much considered in the last 50 years. Yeah. Um, th thanks so much, Bengt, uh, Paul. Uh, by the way, Paul had a, a, a nasty accident in the, in the kitchen. Um, um, no long-lasting effects. But uh, at least temporarily, he was um, vetoed from travel by his, by his doctor. So that's why he's on video link. Um, just to, to, to explain um, the situation. Uh, Bengt or Paul, did, did you want to comment uh, on, on this question? What good uh, or, or add, to the, add some thoughts to this question? Did we do all good to society or were there also negatives? Yeah, I, I'd be happy to um, add something. Do you guys hear me OK? Yep. Well, so um, I think uh, Oliver commented on, on the uh, 
uh, markets part on, on, uh, as on the asset pricing contributions and the benefits that have uh, accrued there. And, and I agree with that. And he commented a little bit also about uh, corporate finance, uh, emphasizing the negatives. There, there, of course, were some positive aspects in the uh, corporate finance, too, as we came to uh, understand more about um, uh, about providing incentives, about uh, uh, about funding startups, certainly the the uh, financial innovation uh, in, in 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 funding new companies has been important. The, I guess there's a third area of finance too, right? Consumer finance, which uh, Oliver didn't mention at all. Where uh, uh, with, within consumer finance, we've learned, for example, about the uh, the way credit cards are managed, the damage of credit card debt, and how competition in two-sided markets um, uh, for for consumer credit cards can lead to uh, uh, to welfare losses which uh, is encouraging us to uh, understand better how those markets might be regulated on the corporate finance part too I guess we could talk about banking and our uh, I'm surprised actually that bank didn't speak up uh, immediately about uh, about bank regulation and our, our greater understanding, um, a greater understanding of how banks operate and movements like, well, my own colleague, uh, Anad Admadi at Stanford, who is arguing for uh, much higher uh, uh, capital standards for banks uh, based on uh, understanding of, of uh, corporate finance. So um, I, I think, you know, in, in all three areas, in, in, in the asset pricing area, in the corporate finance area, in the uh, consumer finance area, there's research that has led to deeper understanding, has affected uh, law and regulation, has affected uh, behavior, which is uh, part of what Oliver was emphasizing. I think the uh, 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 the positives uh, the positives are pretty clear, and and um, I, and I applaud uh, what's been achieved in in the last half century. Th thank you, uh, Paul. Uh, do you want to, or shall we move to the next uh, part of this question, which is just, say, uh, yes, just be, start, uh, start speaking and it will. Okay. So, uh, yes, most of the things, key things have been said already, but I think, I think one thing to emphasize is the importance of finance for economic development around the world. We haven't spoke, you know, we just look at our world, but uh, especially in the most recent decades, you know, think of China, think of you know, Africa, it, it, it relates to this digital world a lot. You know, enormous advances that have brought hundreds of millions of, of, of people out of poverty, where finance has played a very important role. Much of it banking, getting, just getting to be, uh, you know, a system where people have, are banked and not unbanked as they have been. So I think, I think finance from that point of view has been very big and, and increasingly so will be. Uh, one thing perhaps to add on the negative side, or this is not my expertise, but you know, there's been a lot of complaints about misallocation of uh, talent. And, and it relates to, I think, uh, the work that Paul and I have been doing and others about the uh, allocation of effort, so to speak. You know, if there's a, this is a very visible thing to make money and, and Oliver emphasized it also, and it, it drives people in that direction, and maybe there's an excessive attention, you know, to, to, to finance in general. Uh, there's a fairly sizable literature of, of uh, that. I, I, I don't know how to pick and choose from that, but the, oh, my overall view is that finance has been tremendously valuable and, and keeps growing. We understand banking finance banking crisis now better, even though they seem to have happen more frequently and so on. But I think we are on a, on, in that sense on a good learning curve, uh, not just in the West, but, uh, but uh, also spreading it to, to the rest of the world. So I, I think finance is, is one of the places that uh, economics can be really proud of. Good, Th thanks for your views. Maybe we should, we should switch now to the uh, to the next 50 years, perhaps, what, what do we expect uh, coming? Um, where, where can we contribute? Where do you see contributions of uh, the research that all of us are doing? Um, maybe areas that are under-researched, over-researched, what, what is your view? Well, I, 
maybe I continue just to, because it goes into this digital world and so on, which is something I have been interested in. That said, I, I think we are on some kind of inflection point. You know, I, I think in, I've been in this business for 50 years almost, or 40 years, and, and I think it's harder than ever in my view to forecast what's coming, you know, from the mm -hmm. new technologies, from where they are barely started, and, and there's all sorts of scary scenarios, and uh, there's also uh, big dreams about it. And, but but I, I think it's going to continue. Uh, the digital world will dramatically change things. And that said, I think, uh, I think there seems to be, I always think back, you know, what are the, what are the real drivers for why we see particular structures come into place? Why, why are there banks? Why do we see debt contracts here? Why do we see equity contracts there? Why is, why is uh, you know, uh, the questions about why humans have organized themselves in this particular way. And, and, uh, and so I wish people, instead of just speculating about what's coming, to sort of think what are the things, what are the core questions or core needs that people need, need to have, you know, we need to have, we need funding, we need this, and where are they coming from? And most of the literature in the past 30, 40 years has been about information frictions and information asymmetries, you know, we don't know the same things, there's adverse selection, there's moral hazard, there's verification problems. That has been a huge driver of where things have been going over the last, um, say, 30 years or so, or much of our career, basically. And, and I think one of the things that bothers me right now is that we hear about smart contracts and other things, and people sort of say, well, now information problems are less because we have more information. You know, we have these gigantic, you know, models that collect information and so on. And smart contracts is a good example. They, they, they are just algorithms in some sense, and it, it, they don't automatically, you know, resolve information problems, first of all. And also, there's the sense that now, now these contracts will see everything and they will ex They are really just executions. But if you take, a, for instance, Oliver's work on incomplete contracts, uh, and you ask yourself, why, why are debt contracts so popular? In my view, it is basically because it's a cheap contract. Collateral uh, sufficiently is very cheap. And the point is, in fact, the whole point is not to dig into information. You know, the, 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 that's a little extreme, perhaps, view or that contract, but the purpose is not to have to find out. And, you know, that's the nature of the debt contract. Only when things go wrong. But most of the time they go right. You just pay back your loan and we never had to find out what the value of this thing was or anything. It's, mm. a, it's a brilliant solution that's thousands of years old. No. And, and it's not going to go away with suddenly, you know, these, these new technologies coming along. We, we are going to, you don't want to eliminate the fact that we, don't, we won't have to find out everything. And, and, uh, and, uh, and that's just an example of, of how it could be. Yeah, so, know, so maybe wrong. I can, uh, this eases into the, uh, to the, to the second question that many of you asked about. You should really talk with the Nobel laureates about generative uh, AI, generative artificial intelligence. And some people, people equate that with chat GPT. Um, you, you just mentioned verification problems. I mean, if, if we now have robots and the technology to, uh, to make somebody call me uh, sounding like my father, using the language like my father, asking for help one way or the other, it starts to be scary. Is this really Paul Milgram? Um, who knows? Um, <laughs> so, so, um, so, so the question is, um, how will it affect uh, the economy, you think? Um, uh, yeah, verification problems, uh, so we, it's harder to tell false from real. Uh, so, so those the frictions don't become smaller, they become larger in some sense, right? So, so, um, so there's a lot of concerns, but do you see also value in how what value is there to an economy of this new technology? Uh, maybe I start with you, Bengt, um, and then, and, you know, relatedly people all, uh, well, let me not give you too much in one go. I think, I think Paul probably has done actual work of, of you know, using this data in, in, in particular way, but, uh, but as, a, as a general man, I use ChatGPT, I would say, daily because it's a wonderful way of 
learning something about your work or Oliver's work or something. You know, if you don't know anything about it, uh, searching with Google is not going to do it because then you have to start reading abstract and you have to try something. Someone's asking, you know, what good has Oliver Hart done for, you know, <laughs> finance? And, and, and you will get a very nice and generous <laughs> answer and, and actually a very good answer, you know, uh, 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 insightful answer, say with, with, with uh, Paul Milgram. Uh, I don't... I didn't like mine, but <laughs> but I pass it on to Paul. Paul, could you first identify yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it, yes, it's really me here in my office at Stanford. Um, yeah, so I, I have been a little bit slower than Bengt, I guess, to, to find the uh, uses of ChatGPT. I, I have been... Uh, uh, found myself using other advanced computing solutions. Uh, uh, when, when you were, I, I, if I can roll this back a little bit, when you were talking about um, uh, uh, some of the things that can be done with smart contracts, I think really uh, much of what's going on there is just uh, eliminating the trusted third party and mm. the expense and the time that's involved. The, the, uh, the algorithms can do some of the simple things that people can do. Uh, the bank was talking about some of the subtler things that people can do, which involve perhaps uh, using judgment, which are a little bit harder to code uh, in advance. And I think uh, uh, so uh, you were talking about the limitations, but I think some of the things that people can do are, are now done more cheaply because they can just be written into algorithms, which perhaps can be reused and, uh, uh, and bring down the costs of, of implementing contracts that way. I found myself, you know, what taking advantage of advanced computing capabilities in some of the uh, new harder market design problems. You were asking Albert about the next 50 years. Um, one of the things that uh, I, I've been involved with, one Kronos, uh, it's a new uh, a new market that um, does combinatorial trading. Um, it, it's, at this point, it's still in a pretty limited way, but the there are. Uh, there's some kinds of trading or some kinds of markets that benefit not from just trading one security at a time or one security in small amounts. They, they uh, benefit from, uh, from promoting uh, large trades while keeping them private. That's a standard thing now in, in, in financial market theory. They, uh, they, they uh, benefit potentially from combinatorial trades. If you're a large trader and you want to maintain the same exposure that you currently have to, let's say, interest rate risk or oil price risk, and you are uh, trying to adjust your portfolio by uh, buying uh, some securities and selling others in, in large quantities, you might want to link those transactions so that um, uh, you, you, uh, uh, you, make, you sell one set of securities only if you're able to by the offsetting set of securities and maintaining the risk balance in your uh, portfolio. And uh, those involve uh, new capabilities, uh, not exactly generative AI, uh, but, but new capabilities that involve really difficult uh, computations, um, which can be done now uh, very rapidly. Well, not very rapidly by the standards of high-frequency traders, but very rapidly by the, in, in the sense of 100 milliseconds, um, something on that order, where you can actually solve a small-scale uh, uh, combinatorial optimization problem and and, um, and arrange uh, and arrange trades. So, um, so I, I'm, I'm not responding, Albert, directly to your remarks about uh, generative AI, but that's only one of the dimensions: rapid communications, rapid computation, um, uh, ways in which we're making progress and able to build those and into the kinds of uh, markets that uh, that we're designing. Thanks, Paul. Uh, Oliver, do you want to share a thought on this? Well, let me just say that um, I don't disagree with what anybody, uh, either of the other two have said, but I think, you know, in my own work over the last d few decades, you know, I've been interested in the boundaries of the firm, long-term contract, you know, to what extent uh, contracts an alternative to buying a company up. And I think in those situations, um, we're really talking about relationships. So that seems to me an area where 
um, I'm a bit skeptical that this t technology is going to um, do very much for us, although, you know, who, I wouldn't rule it out, but it seems to me that if we have a long-term relationship where, uh, you know, you're supplying something to me, then what's probably more important is that we actually know each other and uh, talk to each other, communicate with each other, and perhaps figure out in advance how we're going to resolve um, uh, disputes. I, uh, we, in my recent work I, uh, with a practitioner, we've, we've talked about using guiding principles uh, that we agree, agree to uh, ahead of time in order to minimize frictions later on in the relationship. So in, those, in that sort of context, I don't see how all these algorithms are going to help. So I just want to mention that, <laughs> yeah. but also say that you know you 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 started off with the question of how do we even know uh, you know who the other person we're dealing with is or whether it's a robot. But at least in these settings, we will actually get together, and right. I will know that you are Albert. Right, right, right. Makes sense. Uh, Can I just add one yeah. thing about uh, Europe? One concern I have is a little, you know, about the future. Is you know. Europe is very big on regulating, but they, they are sort of almost not on the map when it comes to these digital tools and, and the platforms, you know, platform companies which generate data, which generate feed into AI, you know, and so on. They are sort of, they are nobody, nowhere in sight, so to speak. You just look at Tesla, for instance, it's worth, Tesla is twice as valuable as all the European car companies together because it can manage data in a different way. It's not about a better car. It's about, you know, managing data, utilizing data in a way. And uh, I just want to flag this fact that I, 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 I worry about Europe, you know, taking a position as being the regulator, basically, you know, feeding off the idea of, of, of uh, you know, privacy and, and these concerns about privacy without understanding the gigantic values embedded, you know, in this data and utilizing the data. And in, of course, in a meaningful way, but, uh, and, and in a respectful way. But it's kind of funny that Europe is, is leading, so the char leading the charge yeah. on this dimension. And I, I, think, I think they should steer their energies also to... So, so you think we, we over, uh, we're, we're over the, the, the optimum of this trade-off between privacy and, and using uh, data productively in society, yeah, we over-regulate I mean, in Europe? Yeah, it, it, Europe is doing what it knows how to do, which is regulate. <laughs> That's a compliment we are uh, <laughs> happy to take. <laughs> we regulate well. Now, uh, le let me uh, move on in, in the interest of time. Um, and, and this is one question that I uh, personally really like, and I'm happy that it came up in, uh, in, the, uh, in the registration process. Um, um, and I need some words to introduce it. Um, and I direct this to Paul uh, first. Um, the fields, field of financial economics, um, one of our colleagues writes, is, is being dominated by data. There's, there's a lot of data, there's a lot of empirical studies, and we're all in the, in the, in the process of producing stylized facts. And yes, there's a role for theory, uh, but it's often used to motivate uh, the, uh, the uh, very loosely often uh, the, the empirical analysis. Um, it's rarely tested in a, in a, in a direct uh, way. Um, and, and then um, this, this person uh, um, reflects on it and says maybe in finance theories are too simplistic. Maybe, maybe people call them overly simplistic and so, so taking them uh, literally to the data is simply not um, uh, accurate, an, an, another good exercise to do. Um, um, would, would, you, would you agree uh, or going forward should we take theory more seriously and move towards uh, some, some refer to it as structural econometrics, that we really make the data, uh, make the theory talk to the data. And what is beautiful, I've done some of that myself, what's beautiful, if you, if you push the theory onto the data, then you see the dimensions in which there is, uh, there's a lack of fit. And that tells you something about the model that, um, that, 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 that's basically uh, being, being rejected by the data and, and needs, needs attention. And so that's where the scientific, um, where the insights begin, the uh, scientific insights. Um, so, so is it true? Are, um, are, are the, uh, the models in finance uh, t too simple in a way to take uh, straight to the data? What, what, is, what is your poll? I'll start with you f first. Do you have any thoughts about that? 
Yeah, I, well, first of all, I, I um, tend to agree with uh, some of the things you you were saying there. When when I was um, uh, beginning my career, I, I mean, one of the first things I believe I learned is that all theory was involved simplification. We were trying to identify some of the major forces at work, and in order to identify those forces, well, we would attempt intentionally write simple models that excluded everything else. If, if I was studying an auction, I would have uh, bidders who had values for the things that were being sold and abstract from everything else about the context. There was there was no time, there were, there were no uh, alternatives. Maybe uh, Oliver has something else he could buy uh, that would serve the same purpose and Bank didn't. And you know, none of that stuff was in the models, even though we knew for, uh, that, that uh, those things were an important part of the description of uh, of any reality, um, but I do think that the the, uh, the I, I think those first of all those theories were valuable. They taught us a lot about uh, some of the factors, and but then when you go and you and you take them to data, you will find that there are things that are missing. And and yes, that's part of science to see what are the other big effects that we haven't captured in our models, and to what extent do they uh, change the conclusions and and uh, uh, what uh, and and what to be? Where do we really need to add those things because of policies that we're considering? What would happen if we uh, changed rules? And uh, those are the things that we uh, then need to include in the uh, in the simple models that we're studying. But it's always been the case in every science. I think that that uh, uh, the data helps inform theory. You get uh, stylized facts. You uh, uh, build theories to uh, to account for those facts. And and that's just uh, that's just a natural part of the uh, of the process of doing science. And one of the really wonderful things that's happened in uh, in recent more recent years is the availability of of uh, uh, large data sets, more data, uh, more powerful analytical techniques. It makes sense that um, uh, that those would be applied. And by the way, the the the. Um, uh, we're, we're making advances in econometric theory too to help us uh, analyze data without introducing biases. So uh, we we worry about uh, uh, we worry about p hacking. We worry about uh, well as you as you do uh, non-standard errors. We worry about uh, uh, the that people are are milking data uh, to. Uh, uh, to find something that they can say, and and we're learning uh, about what what kinds of econometric techniques can be used to, uh, and what kinds of checks can be run uh, to reduce those errors. I think you know there's a a, a constant tension going on, um, both on the theoretical side and on the empirical side, uh, to to bring our under to advance our understanding of of uh, how the world works in finance and elsewhere. Thank you. Oliver, well, thanks. Anything to add? I, I wanted to say a word about modeling in, yeah. in the sense because I think there is the false perception. You know, people talk about models and then testing the models. And, and they, so most of the models I have been involved in, I think Oliver also and, and, um, and Paul, I'm sure, agrees, is, is you know, because of this simplification, it's about understanding certain relationships that we may not understand well, or we think we understand it, but then it turns out we don't really. And, and we go to simpler models in order to isolate, you know, what, what is really a core feature of the problem that we are, you know, what's the core question, one might say. And, and uh, I learned it uh, in early days, you know, from Mike Rothschild, who was actually thesis advisor to Oliver, he said, you know, you, you need to understand that the, the game here is, is you know, what can you leave out from a model and still have something interesting to analyze, not what you can fit in and, and, and still be able to solve. And, and that stuck with me, that phrase, you know, that we, it's very common for beginning researchers in, in, to, to sort of try to see what they can, how complicated they can make it and how realistic. Uh, and and uh, let me give us an example, you know, I would say one of the most remarkable discoveries during these 50 years, which hasn't been mentioned, is, is you know, the Modigliani-Miller theorem. 
which everybody thought it's obviously true that, that it matters, you know, capital structure matters. And then when they put down reasonable assumptions, they finally realized, you know, it actually doesn't matter. And it created the whole field of arbitrage from which, you know, we got option pricing and other things. I mean, it was just a remarkably fruitful insight from going to something almost trivial when you see the proof, you know, almost trivial once you have formulated it in the right way. Mm -hmm. So formulations, simple formulations, and, and, and that go to the core of the issues, that's one class of models or, 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 or thinking that's really critical for, for, and there's nothing about testing really, in my view. It's about, you know, where are these ideas relevant, where are they not relevant? There's not a, a setting in which you test, but so let me close by saying finance, however, when it comes to markets and you know how markets behave and how well do they fit with our assumptions about human behavior, I think that's where I feel like it's a little bit like the science. There's so much data, so much, you know, so structured, so intense in terms of incentives, you know, people are really highly intensified it in incentivized to do things. So there, I think the empirical book has been, the interaction between really the model and the reality has been sort of more, let's call, traditional science-like. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember uh, Bengt Holmström uh, taught here uh, at the Timbergen Institute in Amsterdam uh, about a, a decade ago. Uh, I was attending, uh, auditing his classes. Uh, at some point you mentioned, uh, and I, it, it sticks with me still, is when you, when you build models, um, you sort of speak to them, you put everything that you know into those models, and at some point it starts speaking back. There, there, there is something that you don't anticipate popping up, and, and that's when you mention that that's when it gets interesting, because then we, we start to learn something, and we have that conversation with the model. So whenever I teach, I still use that metaphor. I think it's beautiful. Yeah, you should listen to the model speak. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Oliver, do you um, have anything? Yeah, I think I very much agree with the other two about this. I mean, I would, just to pick an, uh, uh, another example, um, general equilibrium theory. I mean, I think that's a beautiful construct. Um, I mean, we've sort of moved on from that. People don't do that so much anymore. But, you know, one, it's, it's great to see how all the different pieces interact. I mean, that's what a general equilibrium general equilibrium model does for you. Um, I wouldn't, you know, some people in the past have taken that literally, and, you know, people have uh, estimated a Valrhesian model, uh, model of the U.S. economy or something. I have to say I'm pretty skeptical about that. I wouldn't do that. I would think that it's more, um, you know, teaching us something uh, about how markets work, but I wouldn't want to take it literally. Um, and I think that's that's basically the way most theory is. It's, it, can, it, it, it teaches you, it, it gives you insights, it helps you to understand the world. I mean, I don't see how you could understand the world without any theory. I mean, just looking no. at the data, you can't do it. No. So theory guides you, but I, um, I, you know, in most cases, one wouldn't want to take it literally. Yeah, thanks. I'd like to move on to the to the next uh, next question. Um, which is another big theme, uh, the, the replicability, uh, reproducibility uh, crisis, some people say, that's, that's raging across all fields of science. Uh, it has um, entered finance. Um, it's hard for us to, um, uh, to replicate the results of earlier studies, some of them using the same data, trying, you know, reading the paper carefully and doing the same thing. It's hard to get the, uh, the estimates that were reported. Um, um, I myself, with many of you, uh, have um, uh, looked, at, looked at some of this um, um, by, even if you have the same data, uh, because we know when, when, we, when we have estimators to estimate population means, we know a sampling error, and so therefore uh, the estimator is the, is the population mean plus noise, and that noise, the standard uh, deviation thereof, we call standard error. Yeah, that's a level. That's a source of uncertainty coming from the data. But even if you fix the data, and you give the same task to uh, uh, a multiplicity of research teams, who independently will test the hypothesis, and what we did was on on, on, on German data, uh, we asked uh, simple things like two decades of trading in the um, the uh, the local equivalent of E-mini, uh, the Eurostoxx 50 index futures. 
the beautiful data, two decades of data, a bid ask spread or transaction costs. What was the annu annualized percentage change? Um, so all these teams the world over worked on it and came to numbers. Uh, and, and, and of course, they make different choices in uh, how to organize the sample, what statistical method to use, even what software to use. Um, uh, so they, they had their favorite analysis path. And we get different estimates from these 164 teams, which in and of itself is not surprising. But the dispersion in the estimates was of a level of magnitude that I had not anticipated. So that all of these small choices we make, you know, on all of those forks of the analysis path, uh, they add up to substantial dispersion. And therefore, if we get a single study um, and a single estimate, um, not only is there uh, dispersion due to sampling error, there's also dispersion because of all these choices that teams um, uh, make. And, and so we, we've labeled it uh, non-standard error in, in the sense that this dispersion is coming from the fact that we don't have an, a standard analysis path. Um, everybody has a slightly different idea of what the best analysis path is. Um, this is a bit of a lo long winded uh, introduction of the question, but the question is, I, I know you're, you're theorists, um, um, and, uh, but do you have a view on this? And is there maybe a, a mirroring result for theory that y you have to specify uh, distributions for all of these stochastic factors in your models? You have to specify preferences. To what extent are the results dependent on those? And, and, and do we have a non-standard error even in theory? Where should I begin? Happy to speak up. Um, yep. I think you know. Uh, even in theory, the other thing that you know, we were just talking, uh, Oliver and Bank and I, about uh, deciding what to include in our theoretical models. And <clears throat> one of the things that goes on in theory is uh, somebody will, uh, uh, you know, write down a model. You mentioned uh, uh, a moment ago, uh, Medigliani Miller. Uh, talking about, you know, if you write down a model in which you exclude certain things, then uh, then uh, capital structure doesn't matter, then you might add uh, taxes or you might add other frictions, uh, and it does matter, but what you include in your model is going to, uh, is going to affect the conclusions. That's all part of understanding. Let me widen this conversation a little bit because it isn't just about, you know, the, the uh, non-standard errors. When I talk to my friends who run experiments, especially in economics, but even in, in, in psychology and other areas as well, uh, they often speak of, um, you know, you don't really learn from one experiment, one experiment. You might not learn from one data analysis either. If you have a, if you have a hypothesis, you want to approach it in a variety of ways. And, and uh, you'd like to see whether when you, you know, twist it and turn it and look at it from different angles, whether, um, whether all the experiments are supporting the same uh, general, the same general conclusion. Hopefully, our hypotheses are interesting enough that they have multiple implications, and we can be examining all of them and trying to understand um, uh, whether our, our theory is consistent with all of those things. What other elements uh, uh, need to be included to account for what we observe in the world? Which exclusions from the theory uh, 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 were important? Now, what you've talked about in, in non-standard errors is more specific than that. You're talking about even for a, a fixed data set, and, uh, but I think you know the, the whole method of, theor uh, of theorizing and, um, and, and applying uh, empirical techniques, I think we have come to learn that our perspectives, uh, our perspectives matter a lot, and that's the reason why uh, we only become convinced of things when uh, when we've looked at them from multiple points of view, when you know Oliver writes about the uh, theory of firm based on incomplete contracts, and Beck and I write about it from the point of view of incomplete information, and we start to say, what, you know, what is it really driving uh, these observations? Uh, you don't look at one paper to provide a, a deep answer to a um, uh, a scientific question. You really look at a whole literature and a, a whole series of experiments to be, before you're confident in any, um, uh, in any single conclusion. Right, thank you. 
Yeah, if I can just, I, I totally agree with Paul on that. I think it's a sort of robustness uh, exercise that, you know, someone writes a theoretical paper, they get some result. Now, I mean, one possibility is that the result's wrong. I mean, that can happen, but one hopes it doesn't happen. But um, what is more likely is that the result might turn out to be very sensitive to the assumptions and somebody else will write a paper pointing out that with a slight change you get something entirely different you know the th and the, and then people will say you know yeah that w the result was true but it i don't really believe it because it's not robust hmm. this is what i think paul was saying about looking at it from different points of view sort of right. um kicking it around a bit and oh. seeing you know whether it <laughs> survives that and i mean the theory the 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 theoretical ideas that that last are the ones that have been kicked around and they're still sort of standing. Right, right. Yeah. I want to come back to the Modigliani Miller theorem. You know, they did it for a purpose of establishing whether the uh, whether cattle structure matters or you know what and in what way. But the impact of the paper went in a totally different direction, which is the arbitrage part and so on. So it's not, you know, any little twist in these models typically have effects. Uh, so another way of looking at it is, did it lead to some interesting questions or interesting way? It's a little bit like uh, Paul is saying, but I say just opening up a new angle on an issue is, is hugely important. It, it, and in that sense, it can guide empirical work and so on. And, and uh, I must say, the older I've gotten, the more subjective I become. That is, I'm sort of asking myself, do I think, how has this paper or this set of papers affected my view of a particular problem? And I'm not, you know, since I'm not in the business of particularly much giving advice or something like that, I'm sort of satisfied that I, understand, I think I understand the world in a different way. Now, I may have to correct myself, you know, when new evidence comes, but, but this is the best I have right now. And so it's all, it, it's, I'm pushing it a little bit, but it's not kind of natural sciences trying to see what happens, what's, how the apple accelerates when it drops from the right. tree. You know, we, we, this is a very different, and the world keeps changing all the time, by the way. This, this sort of how people react, how people behave and so on, it's, it's, it's a moving target. I don't think we are going to establish uh, any, uh, I think we, are estab we have established what the questions are, the, the important questions, but you know, the answers keep changing. Like that's the point about the, these new technologies as they're going to answer the same questions, age old questions about need for money, need for this, our needs, but, but the answers are going to be very different from what we have seen so far. That's good news for the for the new generation. The, yeah, I think I think that uh, I would be very happy if I were a, a thirty-year-old right now, for this reason. Otherwise, I think it's okay <laughs> to be seventy-five. <laughs> I think I'm happier at seventy-five than when I when I was at thirty. But I, I think uh, it's an exciting time. You're, let's you're, put it that way. I thought right. you were only seventy-four, actually. I'm already seventy-five because uh, I'm it, over the heart. Just yeah. <laughs> Um, can I just make a comment about the yeah. Modigliani Miller theorem? It seems to me that I agree with Bengt, it's been useful in all sorts of other ways, but it still is a kind of benchmark yeah. result in corporate finance. Um, yes, we don't believe it somehow, and yet, as a description, but have we been that successful in moving beyond it? I mean, uh, you know, I've certainly tried, along with, you know, others have done more, but um, on trying to um, come up with good theories, uh, more realistic theories of capital structure. I don't think there, there's any agreed on theory out there. I mean, they're little pieces of theory. Um, some of them emphasize incentive issues, but then the question is, well, couldn't you sort out those incentive issues through using incentive schemes instead of capital structure? You know, I think there are lots of question marks that still, uh, you know, mean that we haven't fully moved beyond the Modigliani Miller theorem, sadly. I think it matters, but it's context dependent, it seems to me, is the answer, or the evidence. I, I'm not sure if one was, uh, so, I mean, you know, if you, were, if you were asked, if someone in the audience was asked to give advice to a company about how much debt it should have versus equity, I, 
I'm not sure we, you know, as a professional, we could really say, yes, we have the answer to that question. Hmm. Understood. Fischer Black was once asked, in, at, Fischer I'm, Black, I'm, the famous Fischer Black was, you know, a consultant at Goldman, and he was sent to customers to explain capital structure, uh, and they lost quite a few customers. <laughs> <laughs> because his answer was, it doesn't matter. <laughs> oh, it doesn't okay. matter. I, I'm, not sure I would, yeah, I'm not sure I would give that answer, I must say. Paul, I think you wanted to say something, Paul. Yeah, I, I just want, I wanted to point out that uh, although this discussion is focused on the Digliana Miller theorem, it, it, you know, it's not unique that way. You could take other equally important, uh, take the Coase theorem, for example, in economics, you know, the, which, is similar in some ways. It tells you that, uh, you know, who owns property or the way property rights are allocated doesn't matter if there's no costs of, uh, uh, of transacting, um, just as, you know, and, and uh, of course the, the idea that property rights don't matter is not something that we ever, ever think applies in the world because there are uh, costs of transacting, but it serves to turn our attention to those things. I think the, the Medigliana Miller theorem does much the same thing. It turns turns our attention to uh, uh, to focus on what are the root causes of why capital structure matters. What are the root causes of why allocation of property rights matter? You can find these things, you know, when when we look at general equilibrium theory, which Oliver said we're past. I have some colleagues who would disagree with that, but the <laughs> when, uh, uh, but when you uh, when you when you look at uh, uh, at, at general equilibrium theory, no externalities in the world, really, no market power. But the uh, but the, these simplifying assumptions often help us bring out something specific. And then, yes, of course, we need to account for those in real applications. Uh, but the, the these uh, these simple theories, uh, which aren't going to be confirmed in the data in, in terms of their prediction predictions. Uh, lend enormous insight into the way the world works. And, uh, and I think when, well, uh, I, I, I'm just repeating myself here that uh, often we intentionally make our, our uh, theories uh, too simple to explain the world. And then sometimes when we do need to explain the world, we want to have more elaborate theories, which we think of as often being more fragile and less clear but uh, but better for explaining particular sets of data. Good, good. The, the next question is 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 one that um, uh, that's somewhat lighter. Uh, what is the what has been the now that you look back on your career? What is the um, biggest mistake you made, and and what can we learn uh, from that? I became. You, you probably didn't make any mistakes, right? I made one mistake. I became an economist. <laughs> <laughs> did you, Oliver, Paul, did no. you want to say something about, you know, lessons learned that are useful remember, for the new generation? I, I remember being approached um, in the early 1980s when um, uh, my work, it seemed to me my work was going really well at the time. In fact, uh, a lot of it did go really well, but uh, I was approached and asked whether I would do some work on the economics of the internet. And um, I declined to work on the <laughs> economics of the internet. Uh, and into the early 90s too, just before Google, and I think, holy cow, you know, uh, there was so much to understand and there were so many important things to do. And uh, I, I've, you know, wished sometimes that I had been engaged in that. So, good, good. So, final question for me, and then I'll turn it to the to the audience. Uh, who will be the next Nobel laureate in economics? <laughs> <laughs> if I knew, I wouldn't tell you, but I have no idea. No idea. <laughs> I thought you were going to say. It. Since I don't, I will tell you. <laughs> 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 the forecast. Anyway, so. There are many, very, I would say, there are a lot of worthy people. Good. If, if we can turn on the light on the audience, if see if there's still somebody there. Yeah, that we still have people. Um, then the microphone is in here. 
um, and you have to speak into the microphone. It would be nice if you uh, state your name and your affiliation before asking the questions and keep the questions short so that more, more of you have opportunities uh, to ask questions. Where can I throw it? Which direction? I'm sure somebody has a question here. <laughs> There, this one. Where? A brave soul. Oh, there. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Almost. <laughs> that work? Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Carolina from Oxford, PhD student. Um, I wanted to ask about the impact of climate change on financial world, but also the impact of financial world on climate change. And how do you see the next 50 years when it comes to that? Do I throw it back? Keep it for a while, and then we'll see uh, what. Uh, so the question is about climate ch climate change. Um, I, let me say one thing. I have not worked very much on climate change, but we, of course, all are concerned about it. But I have been in one group for, in China, actually, uh, working on it, and and and. And I really started to appreciate the value of having an exchange. That is having something like, their, their Europe is in the lead in some sense. They have this, <laughs> this not perfect at all exchange, but it still gives you know, reasonable prices. And, and, and you, you, it's not the final solution, but I tell you, it's better than having nothing or having these guesses about the value and so on. So uh, I, I would say just finance has in that sense, you know, creating financial markets, uh, I think is going to play, play a very big role or should play a bi very big role here. Well, I could say a word. I mean, that sounds like regulation. That sounds like carbon taxes or the equivalent, which I think is, of course, uh, I think most, almost all economists think that is the way to deal with climate change. but doesn't seem to work very well in practice because uh, it's hard to persuade national governments to choose the right carbon tax, uh, the right level, uh, let alone doing this internationally. So I personally have been interested in my recent work, and that's also true of some, uh, a number of other people in the audience or at this meeting, in the idea that we need to um, bring companies in that, uh, that we can't always rely on government to solve problems, so we have to perhaps uh, spend more time thinking about how companies can be pushed, uh, I, th I think, to do what their shareholders may want. We, uh, you know, traditionally, we haven't really asked very much what shareholders want, com what, what shareholders want their companies to do, because we sort of assume they want the companies um, they own to make as much money as possible, but I think it, there's a lot of evidence that, that uh, shareholders are actually willing to have their companies make trade-offs, sometimes um, reduce carbon emissions. I gave this, I, I, I said something about this at the beginning. Reduce carbon emissions even if that hurts the bottom line. And, and so I think that's one, it's, not, it's, I, it's certainly not the solution to climate change because government's crucial, but if government isn't doing as much as it should be, then I think this is a complement to it. And that in the future, it's gonna be important for companies to uh, listen to their shareholders to find out uh, the preferences of their shareholders. Um, I think it's gonna be important for intermediaries, asset managers, to find out from their investors what they want, how they want asset managers to engage with companies. I think we can uh, push voting decisions on company actions. So I'm very much in favor of voice rather than exit. So don't, if you want to uh, change what a company is doing, don't sell your shares, but instead uh, pressure the company to do the right thing. And there are all th sorts of things going on in that dimension, in particular um, voting decisions. BlackRock has announced that it's going to let some of its, its investors vote on um, company proposals. And that may sound impossible, practically impossible, because how could an individual shareholder like you or me, um, you know, 
we don't want to spend all our time voting on things, you know, all the proxy statements we would get, but in fact, there, were, there are solutions to that. You can sign up to some um, particular guideline which will do the voting for you, express your preferences, uh, how much you care about the environment, how much you care about some other social things, and then the, um, there'll be an algorithm that will vote um, according to those preferences. So you sort of delegate the voting decision. Um, new technology, this is one of the things we've talked about, uh, all the technology that's going to make smart contracts possible, but there's this new technology can also um, make this sort of delegated voting possi uh, possible. And indeed, there even, there's a company that um, I know about where you can actually, um, they'll personalize the algorithm to you. So I, I've actually done this with this company. The, uh, they ask you to fill out a questionnaire. It doesn't take very long. You do it once, and then um, they will do corporate voting on your behalf. And you can see what they're doing, and if you don't like what they're doing, you can always uh, take the voting decision back or uh, change to somebody else. And I think that we can, there's going to be a lot more of that that will be possible. And I would like to think that financial economists will play a role in, in guiding that. We, we even have that in, in politics. We have so many parties in this country uh, today that now you can online fill out how you feel about different issues affecting uh, the country. Oh. And it will direct you, it will uh, basically rank the, uh, the political parties for you. Now you still have to see if you trust the people behind the parties, but it, it does, it's similar in, sp in, mm -hmm. in spirit. Mm -hmm. um, can, can I just make a correction here? I'm sorry to disagree. I mean, cap and trade is certainly not regulation, and that's what I'm talking about. You, you, government puts a cap on how much you can... Of course it's regulation. Well, but it's the simplest it's kind the that cap. says... It's the cap. The cap is the regulation. Yeah, but that's not subject to a whole lot of, of, of problems of the kind that we usually think about regulation. I mean, it's the simplest kind. And, and, uh, yeah, and but you have to decide on the cap. Uh, let's... That's, uh, that's I think deciding on the cap is, is, is not uh, uh, an enormous problem in this context. But it, it is exactly the cap and trade is, is something that uh, I think it's better than just setting a tax, for instance, because you, you don't know, you know where the tax should be, but cap and trade gives you no, some no, indication. I, I, but I can't. but uh, I, I, let me just say one thing so, about so we this. Have, we have, uh, Paul, we have uh, you know, cap and trade, is there regulation or, or not? Uh, Paul, maybe your. Uh, you have an opinion on that? <laughs> uh, well, I, I was going to, uh, we've already gone on a long time about this question, but uh, I've been uh, reacting with some feelings of skepticism, both toward things that Oliver and, and, and Bent have been saying. I know in, in China, for example, when, uh, when, uh, uh, when uh, China wanted to, or uh, continues to want to reduce uh, carbon emissions, uh, it decided to impose limits on the largest uh, companies. And um, a, a part of what we've seen as a result of that is that they uh, subcontract and they, they push the emissions off into the smaller companies. Uh, you, needing, it's not enough to have uh, decisions by most companies to uh, uh, to reduce uh, emissions, just we, we need something that is uh, uh, wider, more economy-wide, and I don't think the kinds of solutions that voting at individual companies or or uh, the, the simple kinds of regulations that apply only to big companies uh, will, will work in uh, places like China. And uh, for small companies, we have the usual problems of, uh, uh, you know, complying with uh, 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 regulations. This is a very hard problem, and it doesn't have simple solutions. I wish I could uh, suggest something in response to the questioners uh, uh, to the question, but I don't have simple solutions to to offer. Uh, so there, I, there, I just there react a, with some skepticism. Good. Thank, thanks, Paul. There is a new question. Um, uh, I think. Yeah. Go yes. ahead. Hi, my name is Simone Kunan. I work for the Dutch Financial Authority for the Financial Markets. And my question is, how do you view the developments in the space of cryptocurrency, digital assets, and decentralized finance? So how do you? View the developments in yeah. the space of cryptocurrency, digital assets, and decentralized finance. Cryptocurrency and, and digital finance. Uh, how do you view that? This is that good? The, the, uh, cryptocurrency with skepticism, but uh, I, I think decentralized finance is bound to come. 
and it's going to play a big role, I think, in, in, in sort of restructuring payment systems for central banks, you know, central bank currency, and I, I think that will come. The wholesale central bank, meaning it's, it's, the, it's still under the co control of central banks. And, and I think these new technologies, there's a lot of projects going on, you know, Enbridge, there's, there's uh, regulated liability networks, very exciting stuff about how to revamp completely the payment systems with the central banks in control. Right. We have another question. Hi, this is uh, Laura Veldkamp from Columbia University. Uh, I'd like to know, we've touched on climate already, but what other big questions out there would you like to see the next generation of financial economists address? What should we work on? You know, of course, climate finance, but what, what, what else is out there if for I us? If I knew, to, I would be working on it. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, it's a tongue in cheek, but actually the questions are the hardest things. You know, once we ask the right questions, we tend to get, you know, answers. But, but there's a shortage of good questions. And so it's not easy to give an answer to this. And in a way, you know, finding the questions is part of the fun and, and, and the challenge in and of itself. That's the like big what is challenge, the right in my view. Yeah. There's a shortage of people with good questions, that's clear. Yeah. So maybe there's some more good questions. I, I think <laughs> one last one last one over there. I noticed that there was a, a hand raised for a while, and then we'll close the uh, uh, the session. Catch it, yeah. Yes, a business school. Um, you've talked a little bit about the digital economy, and I wanted to ask you what are your views on competition or lack of the of competition. Do you think that market power is a first order problem, and we should work on that or not? I'm, I mean, the, the different parts of the world, China has, you know, for I think very different reasons, broken up a very, very dynamic and competitive economy. You know, Alibaba, Pinduoduo, Tencent, I mean, they, JD, you know, they had a lot of companies that really competed fiercely with each other and new companies being born. So it looked like a very healthy, kind of uh, market economy or competition economy in, in, in 10 years ago, five years ago, even still until now all the crackdowns and, and the political intervention. So now, now it's, uh, you see from the market values how they have dropped and, and, and the mood is fairly sour uh, there in, the, in that area. So the US has taken the view that, you know, let a thousand flowers bloom. Uh, the usual thing, let the market sort things out. I think eventually they are going to come and deal with the s scale problems and other things, but they take the view, of, which I think is reasonable to, you know, let's first invent things that we know what we are supposed to regulate. This was my criticism of Europe. I mean, Europe doesn't have anything. You know, they have no companies. Uh, or, 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 uh, you know, they are, you know, seriously, Europe is regulating America. That's what they are doing. They are not, there's nothing to regulate here in Europe with regard to this competition side. So, so they... That's three, what we're good at, very regulating, different. so that's what we do. What? We're good at regulating, so that's what we do. Yes, it's very understandable. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, Paul, did you want to say something or did I misread your... Facial expressions. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I didn't have. Uh, I didn't have a lot to add there. No, I don't. I think with a view on the clock, I, I want to uh, close uh, this part of the of the uh, um, uh, of the session. Um, and you know, as a token of appreciation, uh, I want to give you a gift. Uh, and and this is. Uh, maybe the first EFA where we don't have a building uh, as a logo of the um, of the of the conference. Mm -hmm. We have a, a drawing uh, by a, a professional artist here in Amsterdam. Uh, she does a lot of these, uh, and I particularly like this one. Um, it's it's a professional print. Uh, the Rijksmuseum here uses the same uh, printing services, uh, and she has actually personally written down uh, a, a, a message for you uh, in the uh, in the print. I think she's even, even here today, are you? Can you please stand up? It's her birthday today, people, so... Uh, <laughs> thanks a lot. 
Congratulations uh, with your birthday and, and thanks so much for letting us use uh, this beautiful image for the conference. Uh, let me thank you, uh, Oliver, and, and give you one. Thank you. Um, Bank, thanks so much. Uh, here is one for you. We also Good. thought about, Good since you have to travel, uh, this can go in your hand luggage. Uh, yeah, and this yeah, one yeah. Will, uh, will ship to you, um, uh, Paul. Um, Thank you. So with that, um, uh, I hope you, uh, you um, uh, well, let me, let me call the Masters of Ceremonies back on stage uh, who were in the, in the green room. How about another hand for our panel here today? <laughs> yes. Yes, the, the comedians are back, or as you can call us, the misallocation of talent. And happy birthday. That was uh, very stochastic that it was your birthday today. <laughs> we were uh, backstage uh, p-hacking jokes to tell you tonight. And apparently that's not a urine test. <laughs> <coughs> I wanted to base my jokes on theory, but uh, Sammy wanted laughs, so he decided to uh, p-hack our way into uh, success. So uh, I guess first question to me is, is it finance or finance? I'm a little bit confused. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I think if you have a Nobel Prize, you can call it anything you want to. That's right. That's why we have to call it finance. <laughs> this event was freenance. You're welcome. Um, so uh, we talked about Oppenheimer in the beginning. Yeah, you said that Oppenheimer has done a lot of terrible stuff with science, and we want to know if economics and finance can do something good in the world. So yes, I don't think economists and finance professionals are like Oppenheimer. You do good in the world. You're more like Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so speaking of economic development, we talked about how uh, economists and finance professionals have done a lot of good in the world, including from in China and Africa. Uh, we talked about getting the unbanked banked. And uh, I know Sammy has a bank account. That is correct. How did you get your first bank account? My parents. <laughs> nice. Uh, I think that's great. Could your parents also help the unbanked in Africa and China get bank accounts too? Would you lend them out? I would, but they gave me a really low interest rate, so wouldn't recommend. <laughs> All right, well, we are also saving our best jokes to be auctioned off later on. So if, you, if these are low value, then that's why. <laughs> uh, I also liked, uh, Bengt, how you said uh, you, you use ChatGPT daily for questions like, what good has Oliver Hart done for finance? <laughs> <laughs> Although we are not allowed to roast the Nobel Prize winners, they're doing a great job roasting each other. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we talked about what the inflection point is going to be and what's going to happen in the next 50 years. And just because you have a Nobel Prize doesn't mean you can look into the future. They're not fortune tellers. But you did make a prediction which that the digital world will transform us dramatically. I could not agree more. The digital world is amazing. I've already invested all my money in crypto and I make all my food through TikTok recipes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, also, um, this is a fascinating observation about Tesla. Uh, you remarked that they're not necessarily better cars, they just use data better, which is the reason why in the future that data scientists will be great race car drivers. <laughs> Well, yeah, we talked a lot about the unpredictability of the future and how hard it is to forecast, and that just gave me an all-out anxiety attack. So I decided for the rest of my jokes, I would use ChatGPT uh, <laughs> to fill in some of the blanks. So I, I asked ChatGPT to write some jokes about the things we were talking about, or the things that you were talking about, and you may have noticed these are really bad jokes. <laughs> That's what happens when you don't choose a human to be your writing partner, Sammy. Yeah. I guess we should be paying on performance. Um, so, so basically, I asked ChatGPT for some jokes. They weren't good. So I decided to co-write with ChatGPT. Of course, we didn't have a contract. Wow. We had to do our best. ChatGPT is a free writer in that case. Yes. So I'm going to read you some jokes that are uh, co-written by myself and ChatGPT. Um, and if they're bad, that's the point. Why did The Economist bring a ladder to the bank? 
I don't know, Sammy. Why? Because he heard the interest rates were going up. <laughs> They're going to get much worse, don't you worry. <laughs> How many Nobel laureates does it take to change a light bulb? None. They prefer to illuminate the theoretical aspects of darkness. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. I did some of that, too. <laughs> Why did the finance professor or finance professor always carry a college-ruled notebook? I don't know. Because he loves studying margins. <laughs> <laughs> we got a, a laugh on that one. Um, Who laughed on that one? <laughs> Professor Hart, for sure. Oh, nice. <laughs> why, why did the mathematician refuse to invest in the stock market with the number pi? Because he couldn't deal with the irrational behavior. <laughs> I love the people who laughed at that one. Um, why did the economist break up with his calculator? <laughs> he felt like the relationship was just adding to his problems. <laughs> how, does a, how does a finance expert stay cool in the summer? AC? They, they keep their assets liquid. Okay, oh. <laughs> here's a couple more specialized ones, okay? Why did the capital structure start a band? Because it wanted to find the perfect harmony between debt, equity, and a killer drum solo. <laughs> I really like that one for some reason. Okay, here's my favorite. Why did Professor Albert Mengfeld refuse to play hide-and-seek with the market? Why? Because every time he tried, the market found a way to reveal his strategies. I like that one, Sammy. Yeah, that one is good. Why did the non-standard error go to therapy? Because it was tired of constantly being misunderstood and thought of as an outlier. <laughs> Why did the non-standard error refuse to go to the party? because it didn't want to deviate from its plans. Okay, here's the, here's the good one. Saving, the, the, we, we wanted to save this to auction off, but Sammy is gonna give it to you for free. Why did the statistician become a magician? Because they were great at making p-values disappear. <laughs> that was the best one, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, <coughs> I think we p-hacked our way into that. Yeah, we're going to, uh, this is being recorded, we're going to go and post and edit everything so the p-values are removed. Yeah, why don't you applaud and laugh one more time so we can use it in post-production? <laughs> <laughs> How about a hand for our amazing Nobel laureates, Albert Mengfeld, <laughs> Professor Oliver Hart, Bang Holmstrom, and thank you, Paul Milgram, for joining. We appreciate you all coming out today and joining us. Have a great afternoon. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. You.